Fresh off the Penumbra series, Friction released Amnesia The Dark Descent. And let's face it, you know what this game is, your dog probably knows what this game is, and that's because this is the game that arguably made YouTube Let's Plays explode into the mainstream. A strange and magical time where your dad could forward you the Milky Ways clip. Oh shit, I have a bag of Milky Ways! It kickstarted an entire horror genre away from action, spawned countless imitators, and still gets the occasional update. Not to mention all the custom stories or mods like Penumbra Necrologue. Its influence isn't going away anytime soon, and with good reason. So, break out your finest webcam reaction face, and let's talk about the game. What have I done? This is crazy. Don't forget. Don't forget. I must stop him. Focus. My name is... Is... I am Daniel. And Daniel's in for some classic German hospitality. It's 1839, and Daniel has woken up in Brennenberg Castle. A mysterious fortress located somewhere in Prussia, and likely built as one of the Holy Roman Empire's many, many tollbooth castles. Daniel has no memory of how he got here, or what he was doing here at all. Though after stumbling through the castle's foyer and witnessing a few Scooby-Doo episodes worth of supernatural events, he finally gets some answers, discovering a letter from himself. He has purposefully taken an amnesia potion. Daniel needs future Daniel to go to the castle's inner sanctum and kill its Lord Alexander. Also, you're being pursued by a reality-shattering, unknowable force, Hugs and kisses, the former Daniel. So it's a long crawl through a haunted castle discovering its secrets, the fragments of your past, and all while keeping one step ahead of the Nightmare Shadow pursuing you, and Alexander's renowned guest services committee. Now unlike Penumbra which had three difficulty options, Amnesia only launched with one, but a few years later they added a hard mode. This is a significant shakeup to how you play, but I did beat both for this video. You definitely shouldn't make hard mode your first run, but I'll talk more about all that later on. So as you'd expect from the title, visually, Amnesia is a gloomy, moody game. And yeah, the levels of darkness actually can hit about pitch black at points. This ties into a big mechanical change that's been made since Penumbra, since there, if you were still long enough, you got some night vision. Amnesia is perfectly fine throwing you into the abyss, and again, hard mode will be a perfect example of that. See, visually, most horror games don't get this fucking black. Because they do want players to be scared, but, you know, also able to see what they're doing. Because before this, the biggest mainstream game to have oppressive darkness at its core was Doom 3. There were plenty of sections where you had to rapidly shift between using your flashlight and using your gun, because otherwise, you actually could not see. And this approach came with a lot of baggage already due to being a Doom sequel, to the point that the re-release gave you a standard FPS flashlight, which does ruin what it was going for. My point is, Doom 3 and 50 Cent Blood on the Sand weren't the levels we're hitting here. Your only tools are a lantern that you have to refill with oil and watch its capacity carefully, and finding tinderboxes, which you can use to light up sources in the environment and stave off the darkness. Now the obvious penalty is without light, you're fumbling around in the darkness, can't progress or find items easily, and might bump into something nasty. Which is a lot of potential frustration they're okay with the player having. Even Doom 3's flashlight was unlimited, you just had to switch over to it. That's because the plan here is that if you are in the absolute darkness scenario, you should be overflowing with tension instead of frustration. And that's where the sanity mechanic comes in to give it that extra kick over the edge. When Daniel witnesses something supernatural or unsettling, if he sees a monster and continues to stare at it, or is simply sitting in darkness, sanity will start going down. Sanity has all kinds of visual effects, and really, Amnesia itself is kind of a post-processing lasagna. YouTube already struggles with darker games due to compression, and even if you aren't losing your mind, Amnesia has a lot of effects which won't help anything on that front. So if you want the authentic I'm about to faint vision experience, you'll have to play the game. Anyhow, becoming more insane warps and shifts your vision. You get lots of strange effects and filters, and even the game world itself can change. You can hallucinate frightening events right down to monsters suddenly appearing and vanishing. You'll find more disturbing scenes in the castle, and the mundane can become twisted. Call of Cthulhu has a long shadow, and Amnesia has a lot of neat sanity effects. When it gets bad enough, it adds a kind of floaty input lag effect to all of your controls. Like your vision is tunneling and you're on the verge of passing out, which you will when it hits zero. You can't move for a bit, and the loud thud will attract enemies. But even before that, you're warned that your sanity getting too low, or looking at enemies too long, will make it easier for them to spot you. So instead of going, at least the darkness is hiding me, the game has said it's making you more vulnerable, and it will just keep getting worse. And as the screen is warping around and you're hearing stranger things, you definitely believe it. You can't stare down the monsters all day anymore because just looking at them gives them power. They'll make you crazy, and being crazy makes you dead. You only regain sanity by hanging out in the light or accomplishing tasks. They get more literal with it sometimes, but it's an amazing way to keep up the idea of don't let them see the monster. You can hide in the dark, but not in a way where observing gives you an advantage. 
you only want to take occasional glances at the bad man to not hit your sanity too much, and between that and all the distortion effects, you don't have a solid look at what's actually hunting you. Only glimpses of some shambling creature. The game mechanically benefits you from looking away from its threats, and that helps build up tension. And sure, one of their designs is very famous now, which is what makes it all the more impressive. Their base designs are already great as twisted human forms, but it's still one of those games where knowing the monster doesn't make it much less scary. Well, except if you look at some of their old concept art. As for the environment itself, Brennenberg is a fantastic haunted castle. It can be cramped and claustrophobic, but equally ornate and regal at points. With its shields and eagles, it's clearly the castle of a Prussian lord, but sometimes that influence melts away to something more strange and ancient. Even the proportions of rooms, some are unnaturally large and empty, others have bizarre decor or being used for strange purposes. Parts of the castle that are made to be cozy and accommodating in their prime still feel unnatural, and the glimpses you can take outside are just buried in fog and isolation. The castle has precious few areas that actually feel safe, and even these have something otherworldly about them. I appreciate it because obviously it's a creepy castle on its own, but the more you really investigate some rooms, the more uncanny things you're going to notice. And I'm not saying Amnesia's horror is subtle, the moment you start the game you get hit by a Category 5 ghost hurricane, but it's good at sprinkling details you might not notice at first, or get packed into the back of your brain beyond the obvious. It's a visually atmospheric game, but one of those that's pushed to the next level by the sound design. From the moment you enter Brennenberg, Amnesia is piling you with it. It's like something horrible is happening in the castle every single moment if you're listening carefully enough. Not that it's true, but even the quiet moments have so much layered into the soundscape. The wind through the halls, wooden creaking, the hum of some distant machine, and every so often, a sound that tells you the shadow is still in pursuit of you. Even when the game is not actively trying to scare you, every bit of the sound is building intrigue and tension. And when the sound is trying to scare you, Jesus Christ, they're good at it. I think Amnesia's sound design is the absolute heart of what makes it so scary for people. Just playing the game, the ambient effects are great, but mainly quiet. When there's music, it's slow and suspenseful, and mainly blending into the background sounds. Music only comes to the front when it's telling you more about the story, you're in danger, or you've escaped danger. The most memorable tracks in the game come after you've barely escaped with your life. The calming music and release from Amnesia's usually oppressive sound design is your reward. The sound and music is always building up, and it either lands here, or it goes to the chase. In Amnesia's most hostile areas, they amp up the sound in variety, but not in volume. There's more random scraping, or maybe a footstep, or a sound you can't quite recognize. Then they'll mix in some more prominent, scarier sounds. It's not a loud bang to make you jump. It doesn't have to be, and they don't want that. The truth is, cheap jump scares are bad for two reasons. The first being, it's not lasting horror. If I drowned out all the sound and play a big... All I did was trigger the part of your caveman brain that says, watch out for tigers, and then you know there's no danger. It also means all the tension you built up to that point is just gone. That wasn't Freddy Fazbear, it's just my fucking cat or whatever. All of that stress you're building up internally gets released. Do you want your audience to feel that when a plank has fallen over, or when the monster is revealed? Amnesia is so effective because of its restraint in this area. It takes a long while in the game until you even glimpse a monster, and because you're likely playing so carefully and quietly, even longer until you're chased by something. Even Penumbra didn't wait this long before showing its hand. And coming back to play Amnesia, I thought my heart rate wouldn't go above resting because I'm familiar enough with it. But they're so damn good at how they pace their scares that it still got me at a few points. Instead of wasting it on a cheaper scare, they still tickle the tiger part of your brain, but the one that says, The TIGER IS IN PURSUIT. Because Amnesia has few enemy types, which you barely see clearly, then you hear their warning cry cut through everything. It's clear, it's strange, and then they see you. The truth is, that fucking siren is the real monster. 
After quiet, dread-inducing exploration, hearing that violent siren spin up is incredibly alarming. And I want to emphasize, it spins up, and it'll wind down when the monster loses sight of you. Even this isn't a sudden, loud sound, it has a build-up to it. The monsters and the sounds are borrowing some pages from Silent Hill, but it's so simple and so effective. I know what the monsters look like, I know what the trick is, but even now, on a fresh playthrough, being chased by the monster those first few times still makes me feel a way that few horror games do. They save their most intense sounds for when they'll be the most effective. It's just that easy. As for the voice acting, it's a small cast, but excellent. The writing itself conveys that Daniel is curious and a bit naive, but his delivery is so polite and gentle that it fills in the blanks that outside of the events of this game, he's likely a good person. You get audio flashbacks where he comes across as a decent person and over his head. Meanwhile, Alexander sounds like Dracula at a social event. He's refined, intelligent, but there's a clear underlying menace. And he delivers every sentence like he's kind of toying with you and knows something you don't. Alexander, is it inside the castle? In a manner of speaking, come, bring the lamp. You've been to the refinery, have you not? I don't believe I have. Is it connected to the... What did you call it? The inner sanctum. My most precious chamber, Daniel. And it lies well beyond the refinery. In fact, it lies beneath the very stone of Brennenburg. Now there's a voice you can trust. As for the gameplay, it's fairly straightforward. For starters, it has the same kind of physics controls as the Penumbra games. You can physically pick up and throw most objects. Searching a desk or wardrobe will mean physically opening each drawer. And of course, you'll need to physically push and pull doors. Once again, it adds some physicality to the world and unique solutions for puzzles, and will be much more difficult when the Prussian penetrators are after you. There's also no combat at all this round. The most you can do is throw an object to distract a monster, or throw an object at one, which might make them stumble for half a second or so, but you're not killing them. Sneaking and peeking is the name of the game here. You find items you need, solve puzzles in your way, and try to do it all while keeping your organs on the inside. When it comes to the puzzles, they're even more straightforward than Penumbra's, and very little of them have moon logic. You still have an inventory for carrying tinder boxes, oil, health potions, and items you need, but many puzzles don't require aspects like item combining. More than anything, it's a scavenger hunt to find what you need to progress, and then you do the puzzle in the game world itself. And again, Penumbra had these too, but it now leans way more into solving the puzzle inside the environment. There's no off-putting item combining, and generally, the puzzles are simple. Instead, the pressure comes from not getting caught doing all this. For example, Brennenberg has the most reviled, evil storage room in Germany. For back then, anyways. There is hardly any natural light to speak of. Alexander's finest are actively on the prowl, and you're looking for parts for an elevator. Having to crawl through hostile territory and retrieve something while you're there makes for some great sequences. If you get caught and die, you're thrown back to your last save. You can save manually, but I would recommend sticking with the game's autosaves. It's pretty rational for where it triggers and is rarely far too back to be annoying. In contrast, sometimes you complete a task and instead of relief, a monster will come in to check what you've done. Amnesia sadly gets more predictable for this as it goes on. Having one come through the wall or rise from a pile of debris or somehow have been in the room the whole time could have been a shakeup. But instead you hear them coming from a decent while away, have time to hide somewhere, they'll break the door down, look around, and then take off from the level. Even a little remix would be welcome, like one coming back into the area to double check. But as is, it has you scrambling the first time or two, and then you just start expecting it. If nothing spawns in, you just move along. Only being able to run and hide here does work because it's a shorter game. When you feel like the dance might be getting old, you're likely 6 or so hours into the game near the end, and not something like 12 hours in. The castle has enough variety, and the story is intriguing enough to keep you going. It also helps that they save their strangest visuals, developments, and areas until that final stretch. So it's not more pure Scooby-Doo castle, it begins to make you wonder again. It's a solid, well-paced horror adventure. Which brings me to hard mode. This one is extremely reliant on you knowing the game, and it can feel surprisingly different. For starters, tinderboxes. Fucking forget about them. This is a war and you're rationing. The game will barely spawn any, and there will barely be any oil for your lantern. You now use tinderboxes to save, which means knowing where the problem areas are. Now, I'm not going to say it in this video, but there's a fairly well-known secret to Amnesia's sanity system. Well, if you thought it wasn't doing quite enough for the game, now when it hits zero, you just drop dead. And how you can tell you're in trouble is incredibly vague below 25%. You only know that I'm extremely mentally ill and I'm fumbling through darkness. You will scrounge for any crumb of light to stave off the madness, but not tinderboxes because that's your save. You'll never truly catch me, mutant. I've already shit myself to death.
I cannot stress enough how at risk you are this campaign. That example earlier, I had my lantern out but something spooky happened there so it just killed me. You must avert your eyes from all sin. If you hear a scary sound, you look at your feet. It's no longer a pile of disadvantages, it's game over. And because of your lack of light, it means you'll still need to crawl through near pitch black areas. Only pulling your lantern out for a moment or so to stop the sanity drain and see what you're doing. Lacking a tell for imminent death by crazy, like a choking sound, makes the beginning especially frustrating because there's a surprising amount of areas you can die in. Areas that don't need any monster. But once you do start getting your strategic save points up and have to go through the game without tinder boxes or much of a lantern, it does make some sections even tenser than before with all that progress hanging in the air. It's a fun way to replay the game if you're okay with suddenly dropping dead sometimes. So that leaves the story, and if you don't want spoilers, go to here. Daniel's part in everything began on an expedition in Algeria where he discovered a mysterious orb. When he touched the orb, it completely shattered, and while he kept the pieces, he couldn't reassemble it. They seemed to shift and change on their own, and never came together correctly. When he returned to London, he consulted many experts on the orb, but they didn't have much information. To make it worse, each he consulted would turn up horribly eviscerated a few days later, and he learned the same thing happened to the rest of the expedition in Algeria. What Daniel could find out was that the orbs appeared to have great power and symbolism in human history. But there was nothing concrete until, after a night of nightmares, he reassembled the orb in some kind of fugue state. He threw out lines everywhere, and his only promising response was from Alexander of Brennenberg, who said he knew exactly what was happening. Arriving at the castle, Alexander seems incredibly promising. Alexander's an educated man about these things, and many others. An uncanny amount of others. Daniel even compares him to Leonardo da Vinci, and it seems appropriate. The castle has advanced machinery for the time, and even more wondrous things below. Alexander explains that the orb is supernaturally powerful, but by touching it, he's invoked the wrath of the Shadow which is some kind of force that trails those unable to wield the orb's power, and that's what's been obliterating everyone in Daniel's path. It's slowly trailing behind Daniel, but will eventually catch up. To ward it off, he'll need to follow Alexander's instructions. This would get gruesome. As a baron, part of Alexander's duties included sentencing and punishing prisoners, which included brutal forms of torture. Alexander assures him that these are despicable criminals, and the process is needed to ward off the shadow. The process extracts something called Vitae from its victims, it's something like an adrenaline where the more fear and suffering a person experiences, the more it can be drawn out from their blood. Alexander would even give victims amnesia potions so they wouldn't be used to the situation. The man has an entire methodology of torture to pass down to Daniel. Killing them outright is no good for this process of fear extraction. And on a meta level, this note is basically a design document for the game. Show and imply what's going to happen. Avoid taking a step too massive so the whole process can be sustained. Apply the technique in small doses with room for the person to settle. As long as the person is suffering, it's making Vitae. Only with careful performance will the victim yield maximum effect. So there's an extra fun layer to that. But even as the game goes into this process, it doesn't go full speed into gore. There are plenty of torture devices on display, descriptions of how they were used, and audio flashbacks of them in action. But the game never actually shows you anyone being tortured outside of some tasteful diagrams. The show doesn't slow down even when they tell you exactly what they're doing. Daniel keeps crossing moral lines as he tortures prisoners. He does it when it's clear their crimes aren't that dire, he does it when it's clear they're not criminals at all, and eventually he's helping Alexander's servants kidnap children in the dead of night. So the Dark Descent is metaphorically Daniel's fall as a person, and literally you crawling through some basements and corridors trying to kill a sour kraut. Alexander has manipulated Daniel, but why? Well, according to the strange cylinders he keeps some thoughts in, Alexander is not from this world. He's been masquerading as a line of Prussian barons for centuries. He somehow stranded himself in our world. It's barely elaborated on where he comes from, but that adds a lot of mystique to it. He's outright frustrated having to use steam engines and not being able to access tamed lightning. He's been designing and building a machine over centuries to try and imitate something called a traveler's locket. Daniel's not even his first human help on this. Centuries before, Alexander employed the help of Heinrich Agrippa, who was an occultist at the time. He and his student Johann Weyer were actively aware of Alexander's situation and trying to help him escape back. While details aren't clear, somehow Wire opened a portal and made it out. Alexander was left behind furious, and by using Vitae, has kept Agrippa alive in his basement for centuries. Wire even sends a message back saying that he can help Alexander escape, but he needs him to release Agrippa to be able to help. But because he has no guarantee of a follow-through, Alexander has refused. He'd rather slowly acquire Vitae to come back through his own method. What's interesting and tragic is that Alexander doesn't come across as being pure evil. He tried to make artificial Vitae, but had no progress. He tried to extract some from animals, but there was barely a trickle. Maybe at some point he really did only torture criminals, but that process was too slow. Whatever he is, his people consider themselves far above humans. 
So you could just say he's pragmatic, but he seems genuinely hurt and betrayed by Agrippa and Wire's actions. And his desperation to go home is fueled by him having a loved one waiting for him. He doesn't only view people as insects, he's aware that what he's doing is terrible. With Daniel, he was partially honest in how the orb and shadow works. But he's only using the orb and Daniel to get back home. Daniel's fate is ultimately to be consumed by the shadow. And before that, Alexander has ruined who he is. He even feels tempted to tell him the truth before he pulls it off, but also feels uncomfortable at the evil he's seen in Daniel, which he doesn't acknowledge that he's the cause for, which could be some denial and buried guilt. But he does tell Daniel, who instantly launches his plan to murder him. Daniel blames Alexander for absolutely everything because it's the only way he can cope with what he's done. And beyond homesickness, Alexander did feel a time constraint to intensify his methods. The real warding can only do so much, and if he wants to use the orb, the shadow will be a problem. He had his servants reinforcing the castle to prepare for its spread. And on the human end, he realizes the jig is up, and the rest of the Prussian council realize he's some kind of freak immortal. It's only a matter of time until they actively come after him. The shadow is on his doorstep, ripping his servants apart. It's all gone to hell. It feels like there could have been some other way for things to not turn out so horribly. But everything was set in motion long ago, and you're just there to end it. Tell me. Is everything nice and clear now? Am I the villain? The end of the game gives you three options. You can let Alexander go home and be consumed by the shadow. Your sacrifice won't be forgotten. You will be celebrated forever. You can ruin his ritual, and for trying to use the orb's power, the shadow will consume Alexander. It will spare Daniel for this trade-off, who considers himself redeemed. I gave them that awful man. I did the right thing. Or go with the plan that Wire offered to Alexander and send Agrippa through the portal. It appears like everything collapses and the shadow consumes you both, but there is some hope at the end. Don't worry, Daniel. It will be all right. It is nice to have multiple endings this round. Because letting Alexander go and making everything he did in the entire game pointless is the bad ending, there is enough to him that someone might sympathize with his cause, even if he is a fucked up torture vampire. Daniel's escape is considered the good ending, but it almost comes across to me as too good to be true. He delivers his lines more like he's trying to convince himself that everything's alright now. It is a bright light, but an uncertain future. And the uncertain future Agrippa offers does seem more interesting. Also because, again, I'm not sure how Daniel ever returns to normal after all he's done. All the endings make you linger a bit about all that happened to get there, and I can't ask for much more than that but they did give more with Amnesia Justine. This was a free update for the base game. Once again, you're playing as someone waking up from Amnesia, this time being tested by a woman named Justine across various phonographs. The best way I can describe it is, it's like a cross between Much Ado About Nothing and Saw. How you solve puzzles will decide the fate of three individuals. And you can replay it for different endings, which is fine since it's barely a half hour. It's a short but interesting story about a family's dynamics and dealing with loss. But it also has an incredibly strange time capsule. If you remember, Penumbra was not shy about its Half-Life influence. In Justine, you can find a fancy new projector with a note that came in it with shipping. From AS Inc. in Boston, Massachusetts. After you've been running through tests with a disembodied female voice telling you what to do, this add-on was made to promote Portal 2. Urgent, is it? Not really. It's already years late. I just thought they should know. I'm still alive. Alright then. So that was Amnesia The Dark Descent, and it still holds up. While I do miss how Penumbra had and then removed combat for some interesting effects, Amnesia is still great at what it set out to do. It started an entire wave of horror games with no combat. A lot of them fell on their face, which does kind of put this game in the same category as Halo, where a game really nailed what it was setting out to do, but because of all the imitators, the base game itself can get a bad reputation in some circles. This one exploded into popularity for good reason. It's extremely coherent and well-paced. It's atmospheric and has a good story and great delivery. It's a great game for an evening, and it should only be about three bucks for the next while in the pinned comment if the goblins get back to me in time. I hope you've enjoyed this nightmare before Christmas. There is plenty to come in the new year, and I'll see you then. Did I watch the Game Awards? Yeah, it was like watching... That's where I would insert an ad break, because too many ads. It's shitty to have so many rapid-fire awards, not let Neil Newbin finish his speech or Delarian people. Just kind of shameful. It felt like groveling to Hollywood over celebrating games. Did I play the new Armored Core? Yes, and I clicked many missiles. But outside of two fights, it felt like maybe the easiest Armored Core game I've played. It could be the older ones rolled me over when I was younger, but I'd have to go and play again. 
Have I been surprised in a game to the point I broke something? Yeah, I um, I leaned back in my chair, or like, I, I twisted it hard, and the uh, the cable, the 3.5 jack to the headphone to the computer completely broke off. And I was either playing AVP 2 or AVP Classic, an alien just jumped to the screen and scared the shit out of me. It wasn't this big set-piece moment or anything, I just got surprised and my headphones got owned. But that was a few years back, and I've never thrown a controller in my life. Not that I haven't felt compelled, I just baked it in that I would not be able to afford to replace a controller. And that never went away. Also, I have done a bit of amnesia modding, and it's fun. Backwards, man, the back. We can live like kings! Or you